Hello, it's Scott Manley here, and we are with episode 6 of my Kerbal Space Program 100% reusable thing. Okay, it's 100, it's almost 100%. We still haven't recovered the shroud from that nuclear reactor. But uh, yeah, we are launching the Surface to Orbit Personnel Shuttle, also known as the Kerbus. This is designed to carry seven Kerbonauts into space. And you see that we use a standard base on it, but there is an extra fuel tank between the car bus and the, the well between the rocket and the bus, and that gives us just enough fuel to get into orbit. Without that, we find ourselves running out, and uh, that's kind of important. Now it doesn't stay up in space. The only part that remains in space is the actual upper stage. And that has RCS for returning. Now, I'm not going to bother docking this because it has plenty of fuel. We're going to send a space, uh, an astronaut over. He's going to jump on board and he's going to actually fly it in for the final docking. Meanwhile, the rest of the spacecraft can, of course, return to Kerbin under its own power. Uh, at this point, it has drained almost all its fuel and it's an RCS only return. Now, uh, on the return, you're going to see that we actually have to detach the fuel tank. Um, it turns out that really large rockets, I'm sure you know this, they tend to fall apart. And that's, I think it might actually be because the parachutes open at slightly different times because, you know, one end of the rocket is slightly higher than the other. But anyway, yeah, Billy Bobford, Kerman, Bob Fred, yeah, he's just going to put this on the, the docking clamp. We launched it empty because we're really aiming to return a crew to the surface. It'll take seven, but I, we're probably not going to take them all. Um, yeah, I mean, this is going to be an ongoing space program, and we don't want to leave these poor uh, astronauts just sitting in space forever. You know, what am I, some kind of a monster? Hell no. Yeah, um, we don't want to ha have them in space for more than a few weeks because, you know, they want to be with their loved ones and all that. Yeah, that point is, regular crew rotation is going to be a feature or a requirement because, well, because I'm trying to make things hard for myself. So I just figured I'd show you all the, the technology that we're using here. We're just going to bring this in and drop it into the central docking port here, I guess. That's the most convenient one. And uh, you see again, we're sitting in chase mode. Pretty easy to move this one around. It's nicely balanced. It has a little ring of fuel there. Uh, 233 units of monopropellant left. That will be enough to actually deorbit this thing and bring it down. The question is, of course, where I bring it down exactly. Has uh, four parachutes on it, more than enough to bring it down nicely as well. Anyway, so that's that slapped on there. We should bring our astronaut back to the main station. That's his job. His main job is maintaining the station with his friend uh, Bob, I believe. But uh, he was the one that had the chance to bring it in. Now that we'll, and we'll go back to the, the spacecraft you see floating there and make sure that we can return it safely to the planet Kerbin. Ooh. Yeah, I mean, in real life, the crews on the space station are only designed, well, they're only supposed to spend six months in space, although uh, that might change, apparently. I still have, I haven't heard much recently on the Sarah Brightman uh, space mission, but uh, if, if she does go up, I believe it means that someone will actually have to spend 12 months on the ISS in a single sitting. And although that isn't the longest single amount of time spent in space, it would be the longest time that anyone has ever spent on the ISS. But uh, I believe the ISS is probably better equipped for a longer term occupation compared to a mere space station, which, well, started to smell a little, apparently. Anyway, so we're bringing this down over, we're trying to aim for the Kerbal spaceport. Uh, it, again, you know, a bit of trial and error here to get it right, but I do eventually bring it down <laughs> quite aggressively this time. Now, we make sure we're deploying all those shoots. I actually deployed them manually. And uh, once we get close to the, close to getting down to the surface, that's, well, there we are. We're flying over the spaceport, all the shoots out. And now I detach that. That is going to land all on its own. Uh, the main, the critical moment being at 500 meters when the all the parachutes open at once. The I found that regardless of how I balance things, the top end of the rocket almost always ends up colliding if you have it too long. So I've just decided to use the same base for everything and ditch those fuel tanks. And there we go. That's a. We're just viewing this from this angle. 
That's our, that's our fuel tank returned. We should retrieve that, of course. It's nice that we're only a couple of kilometers off the shore. This one, of course, is just sitting there. I am still working on uh, a redesign, or what is it? Uh, uh, well, basically a manual refueling and repurposing. Um, it needs the, the Kerbal attachment system to, to make this thing work. It takes a bit of effort, but uh, I'm hoping to get it working. Anyway, let's uh, go back. Jebediah and friends have sp uh, spent their time on the surface. It's their turn to come back. We're going to bring them back to the surface and of course back to uh, planet Kerbin. Having spent eight days on the surface, so they are going to fly up and rendezvous with the space station. Now I am using mechanical jeb here for displays. What I'm using is to, to watch the orbital parameters and once we get close I'll then switch to the orbital um, to the rendezvous display. I'm not actually using mech jeb for anything other than information here. It's not actually doing any of the flying but it's really nice to have it on there. You can see that I'm fine-tuning my approach distance so that uh, we come in nice and close, one kilometer, and it gives you a, a nice countdown to when we come in close. You see, I went actually a little high over this thing, but that's not a problem. We're just going to make some adjustments. So you see me uh, pushing the approach distance down, down, approach distance 16. That was pretty good. Then I adjusted it back up again. Yeah, there we go. Of course, uh, we don't want to actually come in that f close because we will collide. We only want to get in nice and close and then align ourselves with the docking port and once we're there we can dock our ship and we will return to the planet Kerbin using the the Kerbus, using the space bus which will is responsible for interplanetary transfer although this uh, Mooner lander did in fact perform a, a Kerbin moon transfer it's not going to do that from this point onwards. It is entirely going to be tasked with moving stuff to and from the lunar surface. And you'll see more of that in later episodes. You see that there's a docking port on either end. We can actually use this in sky crane mode where we attach payloads underneath and then drop them onto the surface. That'll probably be maybe episode 7 or 8 by the time you see that. I'm just trying, I'm really trying to show you, give you the whole thing unedited. We're up to like launch number 21, I think, something like that. So, if you remember, this space bus had a problem. They came up with exactly the same crew. It came up with Jeb and Bill. And so is the same crew as in this uh, spacecraft. So I have to be very careful that I don't try to put them in the same capsule or they will evaporate. So these guys are going to sit in the crew tank while their clones are going to sit in the actual control center. There we go, a little, a nice little beauty shot showing our astronaut floating outside the space station as it rotates around because it really doesn't have great uh, control of its angular rotation. I have this problem a lot with the space station. It keeps on wanting to turn around off axis. So I've got pretty good at docking thing, uh, things just by guessing the orientation. Anyway, we'll bring him around and it will be time for us to perform our reverse lunar transfer coming back to Kerbin orbit. Now, most of the time when you come back from the moon to Kerbin, you're basically aiming for the atmosphere, you're going to land. That's not the case anymore. The space bus is going to stay in space and it is going to perform uh, a very, very daring maneuver. We are going to try and bring this down and rendezvous in one go. So first we're going to get our transfer started. Uh, we're just going to eject ourselves out and then once we've got ourselves ejected onto a curb and return trajectory, we are going to then fine tune the trajectory so that we uh, arrive at Kerbin at exactly the same time as the target space station. If you remember, when I came up here in this originally, I, I got myself into a higher orbit and then I transferred down to intersect. This one I want to try and do in a single pass without the intermediate orbit. And I am going to use Mechanical Jeb again for information because we really need the, the high detail on the rendezvous. So that's us, we're coming down, you see us what we're going to do is thrust away from the planet, towards the planet, until we line up the, the, the close approach. And then from there, we're going to keep adjusting the close approach. The, 
uh, so that we end up coming in as close as possible. Uh, you see separation 900, 600, 700, 500, 3, 200, 100, 16 kilometers. They are 2.7 kilometers. Okay, that's probably not going to last because we're going to have to perform a plane correction maneuver here. That's easy enough. But once we've performed the plane correction, we'll again continue to adjust these things. Now you see the approach distance has risen to a whole 14 kilometers, uh, which seems like a lot. But when you realize that this is going to be a single pass encounter, I'm going to be coming down and flying through that orbit space about a kilometer per second faster than the target I'm trying to dock with. And we're using a nuclear engine, so the acceleration on the nuclear engine is pretty anemic. We are going to have to work very hard. A lot of, uh, you know, we're using this information we have, but I'm going to try and uh, guess when I'm going to fire. Now it tells me it's going the estimated burn time to do this is going to be 3 minutes and 22 seconds, so I want to judge this just right so that uh, there we are you can see it coming in about 100 kilometers away so I'm killing my velocity and you see that as I'm killing my velocity the approach distance is adjusting so I'm kind of burning left and right off the yeah, off, off the blue vector to try and adjust my approach distance to try and keep my approach distance going down all the while while adjusting my approach so there we go look 86 meters per second and the approach distance is 1.3 kilometers. Not bad. That was a single burn. There is no intermediate orbit for this rendezvous. That was entirely done just by reading the map and reading the numbers. I mean, I, you could do this by sitting in the map and reading it, but I think it's much more photogenic to actually see the planet. Uh, I mean, Mechjeb does give you the approach distance to within you know, a bit higher precision so you can see it changing faster, but... Uh, otherwise, I just like it because it has more displays. Again, not actually using its controls in any way, just using its information readouts. So there we go, that says 300 meters from the Olympus after a transfer all the way from the moon. That is pretty good. So we're just going to dock it onto the bottom there. And once we're docked, we'll be able to transfer our cargo. That is Bill and Jeb, uh, number two or number one. I'm sure they will argue over who is number one and who's number two. It's always a problem with cloning, you know. Who is the real thing? Who's the real one? Uh, even scarier is uh, teleporters where you could hypothetically create exact copies of each other and, and both of you would be the real thing. Oh dear. Science fiction. Huh? Anyway, look at that. What a beautiful thing. Let's refuel our spacecraft, of course. We're really cutting into our fuel supplies. I hope that... Uh, I hope that we uh, can get our keithane mining going sooner rather than later. So now, yeah, Jeb and Bill, they're going to be the first people to return to the surface. They're just going to use the uh, the crew capsule here. The other guys are going to remain up here because I can't leave the station unoccupied at this time. There will be another crew bus coming up for them and with a full load. And once that happens, they will. that will be the relief crew and... We'll take him back. But yeah, you're just flying around the outside, of course, checking to make sure that it is still space worthy after sitting in space for several days. That's uh the other dude will Jebediah, he will be the real pilot, no doubt. Uh although he did make the lunar lander fall over, but uh this does land with parachutes, so I mean how hard can it be? Oh dear, it's wobbling. I'm not sure what is causing this wobbling. It's really frustrating, especially since you get in and then there's nothing. There's no uh, there's no SAS enabled. Yes. So that's end. We're just we're just taking two people back to the surface. Um, they're not going to set any records. These guys, because you know what, this is a day job. These guys, they've been to the moon. They're coming back. They've essentially demonstrated the whole uh, space bus system. They took. Okay, I mean, they took a specialized transport off of Kerbin, so they haven't completed the whole thing, but they did return all the way to Kerbin and now to the planet, all to Kerbin orbit and now into Kerbin's surface, entirely using the regular b space bus service. So, you know, that's uh, something to be, uh, something to be pretty darn proud of, I would say. I've reduced space faring to being the mundane. 
Of course, you can always make things a little more exciting by trying to skip out on the ch ticket check, right? I mean, maybe we'll have like a Kerbal ticket checkers making sure that these guys are paying their, their fares and not trying to skip through the gates at the other end. Yeah, I don't think I'm doing that. That would be a really stupid idea. Anyway, here we are, fl on final approach, flying around the planet, flying over those deserts, flying over the sea, and bleeding off velocity as quickly as the atmosphere will let us. We shall deploy the parachutes as we come down over the home continent. That is looking pretty good. It's just a matter of waiting for those parachutes to open. We've got the gear out. Everything's looking good. These guys are just going to have a gentle landing. Well, actually, it's a pretty fast landing considering the that it's a capsule and a and a, a crew tank. But uh, it survives pretty well. Those uh, those landing legs work rather well at absorbing the shock of the landing, so that the they can get out and return to their wives and be in top form to uh, well, you know, do what real heroes do, huh? The flight information screen tells us that the the whole return took only 20 minutes. Uh, that is, of course, after the long lunar return. But yeah, I mean, it's it's like the flight from the moon to the, the planet Kerbin. That's equivalent to a long jet flight. And speaking of long jet flights, this is a fully loaded Kerbus that is traveling with the entire team, which will be taking over for the remaining positions. These guys are going to go out to the moon and start prospecting for some Keithane for real. They're going to take up the first components of the moon base. They're going to uh, take up the, the first rovers. But uh, first of all, they need to get out there and start moving stuff around. And we need to relieve the crew that has been on the space station for over 100 days. Of course, 100 days is nothing compared to uh, Sergei Krikalev, who spent over like 800 days in space over like six space flights. He spent more time in space than any other dude. Now, obviously, I've spent more than that amount of time in space with some of my Kerbins, but uh, in this case, you know, these guys are they are going to be one step away from from the planet Kerbin. Anytime they want to go back, they're just going to catch the Kerbus and return to the surface. So uh, they won't be setting any records unless they want to. Uh, no, no, this is going to be a day-by-day, -day, you know, uh, working system. Now you notice here that I'm actually coming in for one of the interior docking ports. The, you know, they are docking ports on both sides of the docking array, and I'm sure a lot of you didn't think that I would actually use those, but yeah, no, they are actually viable locations to dock. You just have to be extra careful that you do not crash into those solar panels. <laughs> Uh, or disrupt experiments by uh, casting your shadow on those so solar panels and cutting the power to the whole station. Now these guys may look like rookies, but uh, they are, you know, they have trained under the best and we expect great things from them when they finally get to the moon. And that's really what the uh, future episodes are going to concentrate on. We've got a whole bunch of gear to send up with these guys so they can start tapping the moon. But until then, I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.